Howdy folks and welcome to what I hope I'll have thought of a title for by the end of this video. But as advertised in this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles, I am finally getting back into miniature painting. Starting with Warhammer 40,000, which well over 30 years ago was the last thing I ever tried painting, and beginning by getting my hands on this getting started with Warhammer 40,000 book from Games Workshop. Only five pounds, it's actually very reasonably priced for a Games Workshop article, and comes with your very first Primaris Space Marine Intercessor model. Now, it's a mark of how long I've been out of the hobby that if you were to say to me, Primaris Space Marine Intercessor, the only two words out of that phrase that I would recognize and understand are space and marine. It's fairly safe to say that there have probably been some fairly substantial changes in the hobby in the intervening 30 plus years. However, because my intention is just to collect and paint miniatures, rather than actually play tabletop battles with them, I don't really need to know. I mean, I'll probably find out along the way, but it's not something that's keeping me awake at night worrying about. Plus, it has the added benefit that I can paint everything any way I damn well please, without having to worry about some rules lawyer pushing their spectacles up and telling me that I can't field that unit because they're painted in the wrong colour. So, as I'm clipping out the various parts that go together to make up this Primaris Space Marine Intercessor, whatever the hell that is, uh, a couple of words about the process of actually uh, filming this process. Because it's a bit more complicated than certainly I had imagined, and if I hadn't watched a video from the excellent Miniac YouTuber specifically about this subject, uh, this video could very easily have gone horribly, horribly wrong. Filming yourself painting something like this is actually a bit more complicated than you might imagine. It's not really just a simple case of pointing a camera at your workspace, hitting record and cracking on. To begin with, and if you're thinking about doing this sort of thing yourself, you know, if you're a talented miniatures painter and um, you're toying with the idea of filming yourself and explaining to the audience how you achieve the results that you achieve, you absolutely must get yourself some kind of monitor. And by that I mean something that you can watch in real time that shows you exactly what is being recorded. Because if not, what's likely to happen, and in fact happens at several points during the course of this video, which I'll try to edit out even though I did have a monitor and could have just looked up at the laptop to see exactly what was being filmed, but you just kind of get lost in the painting process, forget what you're doing, perhaps move up onto your elbows uh, to get a better grip on the miniature, without realising that you've actually moved the miniature itself out of frame, and you could quite easily just spend two hours recording your elbows at the back of your head. So get yourself a monitor so you can observe what's actually being filmed. Now, since recording this, I've actually gotten the second camera set up. What you're watching here has just been recorded on a webcam. It's in 1080p, but, well, as you've no doubt noticed by now, I do have the occasional problems with autofocus, so I need to correct that for future videos. But having a second camera uh, not only provides you a different perspective to make things interesting for the audience, but if something goes wrong on one camera, you can always just switch to the perspective from the other camera. For now, though, it's just the single camera setup, and I am going to forget what I'm doing, forget to check the monitor, and move the model out of frame, so you can't actually see what I'm doing, and I'm just going to have to edit that out. Um, but trust me, things are going to improve in future. So, anyway, I've got the various bits cut out, and as far as a model goes, it's not particularly complicated. Including the base, it's only seven pieces. But before I start applying any paint at all to the model, there's something that I'm going to need to do first. No matter how careful you've been clipping the various model pieces from the plastic sprue, you're going to get bits that are left over. And you're going to need to trim them off with a craft knife, file them down with a file, or sand them down with a piece of sandpaper or a sanding block. The model toolkit that you can see me using here was less than £25 on Amazon and comes with all of those tools and many more. Uh, most of which I'm probably going to be using at some point. For example, the Space Marine shoulder pad here. There's a section that's still sticking out from where it was connected to the plastic sprue. Now, I don't want to go hacking into the shoulder pad with a crafting knife. 
Luckily, the toolkit came with a couple of pieces of sandpaper and also these increasingly fine-grained sanding blocks, which is absolutely ideal for cleaning up the surface of the shoulder pad, while at the same time making sure that it stays as smooth and clean as possible. So with our marine properly filed down and glued together, I'm going to have to prime it. Now this is something I wish somebody had told me about when I first started painting models all those years ago. Suffice to say that if you don't prime the miniature, you're going to find it extremely difficult not just to get the paint to stick to the surface of the model in the way that you want it to, but even worse, after, well, not very long at all, you're probably going to find that the paint starts to flake off. So in order to prime it, I'm going to paint it all over, base included, with Citadel's Chaos Black Paint Spray Primer. And in order to help me with that, I'm going to be using something that we also didn't have 30 years ago. And it's going to make that process extremely easy. Especially if you're doing more than one miniature at a time. For the extremely reasonable, by Games Workshop standards, price of £12, I got this Citadel Colour Spray Stick. It'll take up to 18 miniatures at once. Uh, well, less if they have bigger bases but it will allow you to prime them all at the same time. So if you're painting a whole bunch of miniatures in a hurry, this is an absolute lifesaver. It's extremely simple, it comes with a bunch of elastic bands, and you attach the model to the spray stick, like so. You pick it up on a handle at the other end, and you can angle it any way you like to get the maximum coverage of primer onto your model or models, depending on how many you've actually fitted to the spray stick, without getting that paint all over your hands in the process. So I'm going to take this outside, because I don't want to be spraying indoors. And because I'm going to be painting this marine in acrylic base paints, rather than the fancy new contrast paints that we didn't have 30 years ago, rather than using the grey sear primer, I'm going to be using the Chaos Black. And the reason why I'm using the Chaos Black and not the grey sear will become apparent when I actually start putting base colours on the model. So I'm just going to pop outside and get this sucker primed. So, Dave the Marine has been primed, but the next thing that I'm going to do, and again, this is something we didn't have 30 years ago, is I'm going to prepare my wet palette. Now, this is such an amazing piece of kit. And I wouldn't have known about this if I hadn't spent some time watching videos on YouTube of other people uh, painting miniatures in the week before I actually started trying it again for myself. A wet palette, and you don't have to buy one. I mean, they're not expensive, but you can make one for yourself. It's an extremely effective way of keeping your paint wet and fresh. And it really is extremely simple. This card in the bottom of the palette that I'm applying the water to is extremely absorbent, and it's going to hold all of that water in. I'm actually putting way too much water in here. This is the first time I've ever used a wet palette, so I'm, I'm kind of experimenting as I go along. The card is going to absorb the water and stay wet, and then on top of that you place a piece of membrane paper, and it's semi-permeable, so the water is kind of going to seep through the membrane just enough to preserve any paint that you apply to the membrane. As you can see it's a little bit tricky at first, but it's very easy to get the hang of. And I can tell you now that it works like a charm. The paint that you're going to see me apply to this wet palette a week later, because I checked it again today, is still wet and still fresh and still the same consistency as when I first applied it to the palette a week ago. I've seen videos of people using wet palettes and the paint is still good two weeks later. So you're not wasting any of the paint that you use because it's not drying out. Not only that, the wet palette also keeps the paint at the same consistency. So the first area that you paint using a dry palette after a while the paint on the palette starts to dry out which means it becomes thicker so it starts clogging up your brush more and it applies to the model in a different way so you have to thin the paint out with water or a thinning medium if you have it and if you're thinning the paint with water the paint's going to dry out even faster because water dries faster than paint does so I absolutely cannot recommend a wet palette enough. I wish I'd had one of these. I wish these existed. I mean, if they did exist, they were a bloody well-kept secret, but I so wish I'd had one of these when I was a teenager because I would have saved so much money on wasted paint. Anyway, Dave the Marine has been primed. Now I need to decide what colour I'm going to base him in, and I've decided that Dave is going to be a Space Wolf. Why the Space Wolves? 
The Space Wolves were the marine chapter that I had when I was a teenager, and who doesn't love Space Vikings? Although if forced to confess, I would have to admit that the only reason I chose the Space Wolves for my marines was because I already had an Imperial Guard army and I painted them in black and grey, and painting the Space Wolves in grey kind of saved me money on paint. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a good enough reason for me. Now to assist me even further in painting Dave the Space Wolf, I've got a hold of one of these uh, painting sticks. You don't have to buy one. Again, this is something that you can make quite simply and easily. Just get a wine cork and stick some blue tack on the top and then stick the base of your model to that. But it does help a lot in manipulating the model so you can get the brush into those fine nooks and crannies without actually having to hold the model and risk smudging anything that you've painted. So, the base coat that I'm using for Dave is a sort of, it's a really nice military blue-grey kind of colour, as you can well see when the <laughs> webcam finally sorts out its autofocus. Um, this is a Citadel base paint that's called the Fang, presumably because it's used for base coating Space Wolves. This is going to be the base coat for all areas of Space Marine armour. And as I'm applying it, you can begin to see why I've chosen to base coat this particular model in black rather than grey. Because the black is already in all of the recesses and the hard to reach areas of the model, all of the areas that would already naturally be darker because they'd be recessed in the shadows, this is really going to help add definition to the model. Now, if I was using contrast paints, and the next model that I paint is going to be done using contrast paints, that's why you'd want a grey primer. Because the contrast paints are a much, much thinner consistency to regular base paints. They're also a lot more translucent because of that. So what that means is if you have a model that's primed in grey and you apply a contrast paint to it, it kind of stains the big open areas of the model in the colour that you're painting them. But then it pulls in the recesses and forms a much, much darker shade, effectively creating its own shadows. But I don't need that on this. I've already created the shadows by priming the model in black. I'm still going to need to take further steps later to add further definition to all of those areas on the model that should be darker. But just the simple act of applying a black primer takes care of most of the problem for you. Because I've applied a black primer, I may need to apply more than one layer of base coat to get the consistency and the colour that I'm actually aiming for. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Now unfortunately, despite all of my preparation and precautions, the one thing that I couldn't possibly have predicted was that in his unpainted state, Dave the Marine was going to have to fight off the attentions of an extremely inquisitive cat. God damn it, Akazuki. I did the best I possibly could to try to cat-proof my painting studio, but no defence is 100% successful against an inquisitive feline. Anyway, with Akazuki dismissed and chasing after a ball, it's time to add a base coat of Lead Belcher, which is a metallic paint, uh, as the name would suggest, to the exposed metal areas of the model. And we're primarily talking here about things like the muzzle of the bolt gun, the foresight of the bolt gun, and the weaver rail that runs along the top of the barrel of the bolt gun. Already you can really see the definition on the model, and that's down to the fact that I primed it in Chaos Black, and when I was applying the base coat of the fang, I didn't just slap it on all over. I made sure I didn't get it into all of the recesses so that they would stand out. There are only really three other areas that are going to need to be base painted, and I'm going to be using Retributor Armor, which is a gold metallic shade, to cover the Imperial motif on the barrel of the bolt gun, well, the furniture of the bolt gun, if we're going to be completely technical about it, and also, of course, that very bold Imperial eagle on Dave's chest. With the chest eagle, I'm taking a bit of a shortcut here. If you go by the book, you're supposed to base paint it in Retributor armor, then shade it in Reichland flesh shade, then apply two layers, one of Auric armor gold and another in Liberator gold. Now, on the one hand, if you do this, you will get a much, much more professional look, but it's also much harder to achieve, and you do need a kind of very steady hand, especially when you're applying the two layers. If you do what I'm doing, and instead I'm just applying the Retributor Armour Gold paint 
to just the raised areas of that imperial chest eagle, I'm effectively applying it as a highlight layer. Because it's already primed in black, the black is providing all the definition that I really need. Also, I don't have all of those paints because they're really expensive. Um, and I'm certainly not trying to produce award-winning results in the very first bottle I've painted in over 30 years. Um, I'm basically painting Dave here just to ease myself back in gently, um, refresh my knowledge of the skills that I did learn when I was a teenager, and uh, put into practice as an experiment some of the new skills that I've observed other people using on YouTube. So that is more than good enough for me. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that's always going to be good enough for me. I definitely want to improve, I want to try new things, I want to stretch myself as an artist. But it's been 30 years since I did this, I need to learn how to walk again before I try to run. At this point there are only two further areas of the model that need to have uh, base paint applied to them. I'm using Mornfang Brown to paint the leather pouches and equipment on the back of his belt. You can do them in any colour you want. Um, you can do them in black, perfectly acceptable. Um, I'm using brown simply because I like the look of leather equipment and it's an extra colour on what is already a very grey model. Next, it's time to do something about those awfully monotone shoulder pads. Now, this is where you can add an awful lot of character to your marine because there's a large flat area there for you to basically go crazy on. I'm not feeling nearly that confident, however, so I'm going to keep things nice and simple. I'm just painting the large area of the left shoulder pad in a shade that's called Avaland Sunset. And then I'm going to do the rim of the right shoulder pad also in the same colour. So we're colouring in different areas of each pad just to, just to make things a little different. I'm sure somebody's going to tell me that that's not Codex compliant. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my model, I'll paint it any way I like. And with the base colours applied, and having tidied up any bits that I missed or overpainted that I didn't want to, it's time to apply a wash. Now, when I was a lad, applying a wash simply meant thinning down a nice dark colour, usually black, until it was about the consistency of milk and then slapping it all over the model. Because it was so thin, it ran into all of the nooks and crannies and recesses on the model and darkened them for you. And it stayed away from all of the large, open, smooth areas of the model that should be brighter because they reflect more light. And you can absolutely still do that. But these days they've got these fancy new paints called shades, which are already at the correct consistency for using as a wash, and because you're not just slapping a thin down layer of black over everything, uh, they help preserve the vibrancy of the underlying base coat. Unfortunately, I don't actually have any shade paints, because like I said, this shit's expensive. So what I'm going to do instead is apply a contrast of Abaddon Black, because contrast paints are the correct consistency. In fact, a lot of people would argue that contrast paints are just a fancy and expensive version of a wash that you could do yourself by thinning down your existing paints in the first place. But this is kind of where disaster struck. Because just applying a black wash has killed all of the colours. What I should almost certainly have done was instead take some of that base paint, the fang, and just darken that by mixing in some black then watering that down and using it as a wash. So instead of putting black all over the model, I was putting a darker shade of grey. And that would have probably achieved some pretty good results. But this... Well, it doesn't look that bad, but it's definitely not the colour I was going for. Now I could probably have fixed this by taking some lighter shades of grey, um, some brighter shades of grey, and applying them as layered highlights. But layering is a technique that I have never done. I've watched videos of people doing it, but I've never actually done it. I certainly don't want to be trying it on the first model I've painted in 30 years. So instead I took a slightly more radical, time-consuming, and basic approach. I reapplied the base coat. But I didn't reapply the base coat of the fang. Instead I picked out another color.
colour. It's a much brighter, more blue uh, shade of grey called Russ Grey. Presumably named after Lehman Russ, the Primarch and founder of the Space Wolves, apparently. And I really like this colour. And believe it or not, I have actually had lots of experience of painting things in this colour because it's almost exactly the same shade of pale grey as a Royal Navy warship. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I'm going to be using a lot of this shade of grey. Uh, for those of you who aren't regular viewers of the channel and may have stumbled across this video because you were looking for painting tutorials. Um, my apologies, you're probably not learning anything from watching this video. Uh, but I did serve in the Royal Navy for 22 years, which is one of the reasons why I had this massive gap uh, in my miniature painting experience. However, because I do have that darkened layer of the fang underneath, that I, I could still use that. So instead of coating absolutely all of the exposed bits of armour in this Russ Grey, I'm just doing the big areas of the armour. And at the points where the armour plates overlap each other, I'm leaving the boundary of darkened fang showing through, which hopefully is going to give some nice definition and contrast between the various different areas of armour plating. So with that coat of rust grey applied, I only really have two further things to do with the model. I'm going to have to darken it up again. <laughs> but this time, I'm going to be a lot more careful. Because I've left that layer of the fang base paint that was washed very foolishly uh, with some Abaddon black contrast paint. That's, that's already there on the model. It's already there in the borders between the various different armour plates. Yes, Akazuki, I know it was a very silly mistake. <laughs> I'm doing my best to fix it. Seriously, don't be such a critic. Because I already have that on the model, I can afford to be a lot more sparing uh, with the new wash that I'm applying uh, to the fresh coat of Russ Grey that's on the model. And the end result is, well, it's much better this time around. I still need to add some highlights. And because the coat of Russ Grey that I've applied to the model uh, has been darkened down just a little bit by a very thin wash. I'm going to apply those highlights by taking the rust grey and mixing it with just a little bit of white. And then I'm going to apply that to all of the areas of the model where the light would be striking it from above. Just to try to give the whole thing a more natural look. And with that done to an acceptable standard, it's time to go to work on the base. Now, Painting the base of the miniatures was not something that I ever really bothered doing when I was a teenager. Uh, generally, I just cleaned up any splatters of paint that had ended up on the base from the model by painting the whole base black. This time around, now this particular model actually comes with a very detailed base anyway, something that most miniatures don't, which should have made this a relatively easy job and also provided a visually stunning look. But instead, I'm screwing this up. And I'm screwing this up in two ways. The first is I'm covering up all of that lovely detail in a technical paint. And these technical paints are something new that we didn't have when I was a teenager. There are various different types of technical paints. Um, there are ones that you can apply to a flat base. And then when they dry out, they crack and actually look like dried mud. This one is the exact opposite of that. I believe it's called Sterland Mud. And as you can see, it is very, very thick. There's a lot of texture to it, and it goes down in lumps and provides a look that looks just like fresh, wet mud. The problem is, I've got the wrong undercoat. <laughs> uh, that Russ Grey undercoat that I've slapped all over everything um, is entirely the wrong colour to be applying this technical paint to. It's far too bright. It doesn't look like a muddy surface, which means I've really got to try to work this stuff into all of those exposed blue-grey areas, when if I just apply the base coat of dark brown or even black, I wouldn't have had this problem. So that's something that I've learnt the hard way. And it really should have been obvious. 
always make sure that your undercoat isn't going to screw up any base coats that you apply or attempt to apply over the top of it. But this whole thing was a learning process for me, and very relaxing and enjoyable, even when I was screwing things up. Because I was... It, how am I going to fix that? And the process of fixing my screw-ups taught me things. I learned that wet palettes are an amazing thing if you're using acrylic paints, and we really should have had them 30 years ago. It would have made life so much easier, uh, and saved me a lot of money in wasted paint. I learned that I did still remember how to do things like applying a wash, uh, dry brushing, which I didn't actually do on this model. Instead I tried um, edge highlighting instead, which is something that I'd never tried before, so I learned that I'm not very good at doing edge highlighting. And the, one of the reasons why I'm not very good at doing edge highlighting is, well, there are two main reasons. One, my hands aren't as steady as they need to be. So I should probably try to avoid very fine detail work. And there are techniques that you can use to assist with that. And the other thing that I learned, which didn't help with edge highlighting and definitely didn't help with any really fine detail work, was that my eyes aren't as good as they used to be either. Now, you might think that there's absolutely nothing you can do about that, and I certainly did, until uh, a friend who does a lot of scale modelling and painting, who suffers from exactly the same problem, pointed me in the direction of a set of these. Now, they might look expensive, but I picked these up on Amazon for less than £12. They come with five sets of lenses to provide varying different degrees of magnification, and they also come with a pair of LED lights, and they are extremely bright LED lights, uh, to provide even better vision and illumination of any fine details that you might be trying to work with. I cannot recommend these enough if you're like me and you just have bad eyes. Anyway, the base is done. I'm just tidying up the edges. It's kind of shit. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was a great base uh, and I should have done a really good job on this, but well, I didn't. So, lesson learned. Do better next time. So all that's left to do now is get young Dave the Space Marine onto the base and see how he looks. And it's not bad. It's certainly way better than I was expecting to be able to achieve. I mean, it's not great by anybody's standards, but it's perfectly acceptable. And I'm actually quite proud of that. Well, I'm not proud of the base. I mean, the base is terrible. Um, but for somebody who hasn't painted anything in 30 years, I don't, I don't think I have anything to be ashamed of. Um, and I learned a lot from doing it. I learned that I still enjoy painting. I also learned that I can almost certainly do better than this. Although, I'll probably get worse before I get better, because all I've really done here is reapply the techniques that I learned when I was a teenager, just to prove that I could still do it to myself. And what I'm probably going to do now is try stuff that I hadn't learned how to do when I was a teenager and I'll probably screw them up <laughs> until I learn how to do them properly but that's all part of the process if I don't try anything new I'll never get any better and I'd like to get better and the final and possibly most important thing that I took away from this whole process was that when you have cats everything in the house belongs to them regardless of any opinions that you may have on the subject well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Next up, I'm going to be trying my hand at painting a pair of Imperial Guardsmen. One, using classic acrylic paints. The other, using these newfangled contrast paints I've been hearing so much about. We'll see how that goes. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.